Part seven of the Talking Thrush and Other Tales from India, retold by W. H. D. Rouse. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Part seven. Pride shall have a fall. The kid and the tiger. The stag, the crow, and the jackal. The monkey and the crows. The swan and the paddy bird. What is a man? The wound and the scar. The cat and the parrot. Pride shall have a fall. There was once a great drought in the land. For weeks and months not a drop of rain fell, and the sun beat down and dried up the whole country, so that there was no water to be found. Now there was a certain pond in that country, and as day after day the sun blazed, the water sank lower and lower, until it was hardly an inch deep. Numbers of frogs used to live in this pond, but as the water dried, the frogs died, so that the dry mud on the banks of the pond was covered all over with dead bodies of frogs. There came a jackal out of the forest. He was glad to see this pool, because the pool where he used to drink had been quite dried up. So he made a little platform of mud, and stuck up four posts at the four corners, and then he gathered bundles of dry grass, and put them upon the top of the four posts for a thatch then his eyes fell on the corpses of frogs lying about and being a foolish animal he thought these corpses were uncommonly pretty and what do you think he did he gathered a lot of the dead frogs and hung a fringe of them all around the thatch and in each of his ears he hung a dead frog like an earring from far and near swarms of rats used to come to this pond for drinking since it was the only water to be found for a long distance and all the rest was dried up then the jackal kept guard over the pool and not a drop might any rat so much as taste unless he would first bow down and worship the jackal and sing the following psalm which the jackal made up himself a temple all of gold i found with golden lamps hung all around and see the god himself is here with two big pearls in either ear even a rat can tell a dead frog from a pearl but willy-nilly he needs must sing it or else no water so when the rat had sung this psalm and bowed himself down three times before the jackal worshipping him as if he were a god he was allowed to go down and take a sip of the water one day what should come down to the water to drink but an ox with one eye ho oh, oh, ho one-eyed ox screamed the jackal not a drop till you sing your psalm the ox blinked his one eye stupidly and looked around. "'What psalm?' asked the one-eyed ox. "'Mine,' said the jackal, who was very proud of his psalm, "'my own composition.' Then he sang it over to the ox that he might hear it. "'A temple of gold I found. That's this, you know,' he explained, pointing to the scraggy thatch. "'A temple of gold I found, with golden lamps hung all around, and see the god himself is here, with two big pearls in either ear.' "'Ah,' said the one-eyed ox, "'I'm rather stupid, I fear, and it will take me a minute or two to learn that psalm. It's a mighty fine psalm, that. I never heard the like in church.' suppose i say it over to myself while i'm a-drinking that will save time and it would be a thousand pities to spoil a thing like that this flattered the jackal so much that he agreed one eye went down to the pool and took a long long pull at the water then he came out of the water and went slowly up to the jackal as he was sitting under his thatch with its string of dead frogs and the two frogs in the jackal's ears now then booby the jackal said look sharp the god is waiting the ox opened a big mouth and in a very hoarse voice he sang a nasty dirty thatch i found with dried up frogs hung all around and see the mangy jackal here with two dead frogs in either ear you may imagine the rage of the jackal to hear this he fairly foamed at the mouth you blasphemous beast screamed he i'll teach you to abuse a god and with that he jumped down off his seat and gave chase away scuttled the ox and as he ran the water he had been drinking went gurgling inside him flippity flop flippity flop this sound rather frightened the jackal what's that he cried a dog at your heels said the ox the jackal was so scared at the very name of dog that he turned around in no time blind with terror and away he scampered as hard as he could pelt he was so frightened that he did not see where he was going so he ran straight into the midst of a pack of hounds who made short work of the conceited jackal the kid and the tiger 
a nanny goat and a tigress were near neighbors in a certain wood and fast friends to boot the tigress had two tiger cubs and the family of the nanny goat was four frolicsome kids named roly-poly skipster and jumpster but the tigress was jealous of her friend the nanny goat because nanny had four young ones while she had only two one day as she was musing on the injustice of her fate she thought to herself what if i eat up two of nanny's kids and then things will be equal they do say friends have all things in common so to nanny goat she hied and said she sister nanny my little ones have gone out and i am very lonely at home do let one of your dear kitties come and sleep with me for company will you please gladly will i sister said honest nanny goat thinking no evil of her friend then she ran out to the fields where roly and poly were rolling over each other and jumpster was jumping over the back of skipster children children said nanny goat a treat for you a kind friend has asked one of you out to spend the night ba 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 cried the kids running up and then three of them called out all together dancing around old nanny let me go let me go let me go but the fourth who was a wise little imp and roly it was to be sure asked in a quiet tone who is it mammy nanny goat why who should it be but your aunt yellowstripe said nanny at this they all looked rather crestfallen for although nanny goat loved her friend dearly all the youngsters were afraid of her for what reason they could not say children have a way of finding out their friends and these kids had noticed at times a gleam in the eyes of auntie yellowstripe which boded ill to little kids no thank you mammy nanny goat said skipter skipping away no thank you mammy said jumpster and jumped after her no thank you said poly and rolled himself away by himself why did poly roll away by himself because roly stayed behind roly did not say no thank you on the contrary he said yes why roly said yes instead of no was his own concern and i think roly knew what he was about this was how roly went with the tigress and that night the tigress put him to sleep by her side she cuddled him up and made a great fuss of him thinking to herself soft words cost nothing and when he is fast asleep we shall see what we shall see but roly was no such fool as the tigress thought him so he did not go to sleep but only pretended and no sooner did dame yellowstripe begin to snore than up jumps roly as soft as you please and fetches out one of yellowstripe's own cubs who were sleeping away at the back of the cave he laid the cub in his own place and went into the corner to sleep with the other cub about midnight the tigress awoke and as she felt the warm little thing nestling beside her she chuckled to herself then she gave him one tap with her mighty paw crack went his neck and his dancing days were over the tigress gobbled him up skin bones and teeth it was pitch dark you know and she could not see that she was eating her own cub one less of the brood now thought the tigress turned over and went to sleep again next morning they all woke up and yellowstripe to her dismay saw that roly was rolling about right as a trivet she looked round for her own cubs and lo and behold one was missing at first she could not make it out in the least but when it dawned upon her what had happened she nearly turned yellow all over with rage and disappointment did you have a good night roly dear she said in a wheedling tone to the kid oh yes auntie said the little kid only a gnat bit me this astonished the tigress who thought that the kid must be stronger than he appeared to be never mind said she to herself come to-night we shall see what we shall see that night all went as before only this time roly put a huge stone in his place and then he ran off as fast as his legs could carry him when the tigress awoke she gave a pat to the stone it hurt her paw sadly good heaven said she what a mighty kid it is to be sure i must make short work of him now i have the chance or there is no knowing what may happen when he grows up he may kill me so she gave a fierce bite at the stone and broke all her front teeth now the tigress's fury knew no bounds she went raging about the cave hunting in every corner for roly but roly was not to be found because as i have told you he was not there so the tigress was forced to wait until morning for her revenge 
All night long the Tigress lay awake with the pain of her teeth, and when morning came she sought out a familiar friend to take counsel with. This friend was an old one-eyed tiger. The Tigress and the one-eyed tiger talked for a long time together, and as they talked they walked. When they came to the end of their talk, their walk was also at an end, and they found themselves at the mouth of Yellowstripe's den. There, in the den, as calm as you please, playing with the one remaining tiger cub, was Roley. Ha ha! cried One Eye. So there you are. Let us sit down, and I will tell you a story. Do, do, Uncle One Eye! cried Roley. So they all sat down, and One Eye began. When I eat little kids, said One Eye, four of them make me a mouthful, and I'm coming one of these days to make one mouthful of you and your brother and sisters. Capital, capital, Uncle One Eye, said Roley, clapping his paws. What good stories you do tell, Uncle One Eye. Now I'll tell you a story. When you come to eat us up, Skipster will hold you by the four legs, and Jumpster will hold you by the hind legs, and Polly will hold your head, and Roley will chop it off if only mother will give us a light this terrified one eye extremely for he was a great coward he thought it all as true as gospel so he took to his heels and left yellowstripe in the lurch on the way he met six other tigers friends of his oh my friends said he i have such a treat for you a fine fat kid crying out to be killed come along come along i'll show you the way and all i ask is the pleasure of serving you cunning old one-eye the six tigers believed all that one-eye said and away they all trotted together towards the place where roley lived they knew he would go home sooner or later and indeed he was there already and saw them coming so he climbed up a tree goats are wonderfully good at climbing rocks but i think most of them cannot climb trees still whatever may be true of other goats roley could if it were not so this story would never have been written so Roley climbed up a tree and sat on a branch with his legs all dangling in the air. The first tiger gave a jump and missed him. Number two gave a jump and missed him. They all jumped one after another, and not one of them could touch Roley, who sat and laughed at them so heartily that he nearly fell off his perch. At last, when they were tired of jumping and jumping, up gets old one eye and says, i know how to get at him i'll stand here and you get on my back and then the rest of you one atop of another and then we shall catch him nicely they all thought this an excellent idea so one eye propped his old carcass against the tree and the other tigers mounted one on another's shoulders until there they were all seven in a pyramid then the topmost tiger stretched out his paw and all but got hold of roley Thereupon one eye cocked up his solitary eye to see how things were going on up aloft, and seeing this, Roley called out, Mother, give me a lump of mud, and I'll hit the brute in his sound eye, and then we will finish him off. When one eye heard this, he gave a great start, and down toppled the whole seven in a heap, one atop of the other, spitting and roaring and scratching. They were so much taken aback that they imagined all sorts of powerful beasts to be fighting with them when it was only their own selves biting each other, and the end of it all was that as soon as the seven tigers had each got his four legs to himself, off they went helter-skelter into the forest, and never more troubled Mammy Nanny Goat and her four frolicsome kids. THE STAG, THE CROW, AND THE JACKAL once upon a time there was a stag living in a certain jungle, and in the same jungle lived a crow. These two were bosom friends. Why a stag should take a fancy to a crow I cannot say, but so it was, and if you do not believe it, you had better not read any further. It so befell that a jackal came by one day, and his eye fell on this stag, and a fine plump stag he was. The jackal's mouth began to water. How he would like to make a meal of so dainty a piece of flesh! but he knew it was of no use trying to attack the stag, who seemed very strong. Still, by hook or by crook, that stag he would have. So in the depths of his cunning heart he concocted a trick, of which you shall shortly hear. The jackal watched his chance, and as soon as he had found the stag alone, he began to say, sidling up to the stag and whispering in his ear, beware of that crow he's fooling thee beware beware all birds of the air there's no trusting any bird let alone a crow who is worst of the whole feathered tribe 
Now you and I, who never try in the air to fly, good honest gentlemen with four legs apiece, we are marked out for friends by nature herself. Will you be surprised to hear that the stag listened to the crafty and slanderous words and deserted his friend the crow? When your hair is gray you will know that such is the way of the world, and that a true friend who sticks to the end is harder to find than a diamond mine. But although this stag was shallow-hearted and weak, not so the crow. He was a true friend, and he was cut to the heart by the unkindness of his friend the stag but he wasted no time in fruitless tears. He went about his work as usual and waited for a chance of winning back his recreant friend. Well, Stag and Jackal scoured about the woods together, and the Jackal did his best to make himself agreeable. In this he had poor success, for though the Stag tried hard to like his new comrade, yet he could not help seeing that he was dirty. Moreover, the jackal ate all sorts of dead animals, but the stag was a vegetarian and did not approve of this kind of food. But though the stag had qualms now and again, he was not strong enough to break loose from the friendship of the jackal. But the time was ripening for the jackal's blow. He knew a place where huntsmen used to set gins and snares to catch the wild animals. So one day, as he and the stag were out a-walking together, the jackal so managed that they passed by this place. The jackal took good care to keep clear of the snare, but the innocent stag knew nothing of snares or gins, so into a snare he stepped, and snap, he was fast. Now was the time for a true friend to show his friendship but the jackal, as we already know, was a humbug. Accordingly, all he did was to sit by the side of the stag and try not to look pleased. "'Oh, dear, what shall I do?' said the stag, when he found himself caught. "'Oh, my friend, do help me out.' "'You shock me, friend,' said the jackal, pulling a long face. "'Surely you have not forgotten that it is Sunday. We are told in the Ten Commandments to do no work on the Sabbath day. If it were not so, how gladly would I help you. So saying, he wiped away a crocodile tear. He sat down and waited in the hope that the stag would die, and then he would eat him. But the faithful crow was not far. Though his friend the stag would not so much as cast him a look, the crow followed him ever, biding his time, and now the time had come. The crow perched on a neighboring tree and said, Dear friend, I am only a weak little bird, and I cannot help you, but I can teach you to help yourself. My advice is, pretend to be dead, and when the hunter comes he will open the snare without any care, and you can escape. Thank you, long-suffering friend, said the stag, and so he did. When the huntsman came, he thought the stag was dead, he opened the snare, and before he was aware, the stag was up and off and away. The stag asked his friend the crow to forgive him, and they lived happily together as before. As for the treacherous jackal, he never came near them more. THE MONKEY AND THE CROWS In a certain land a flock of crows built their nests in the branches of a huge cotton tree. In that country the climate is not the least like ours. It is hot all the year round, and for eight months the sun blazes like a fiery furnace, so that the people who live there are burnt as black as your boot. Then after eight months comes the rain, and the rain comes down in buckets full, with lightning fit to blind you and thunder enough to crack your head. These crows were quite happy in their nests, whatever happened. For when it was hot, the leaves of the tree sheltered them from the sun, and in the rainy season the leaves kept them pretty dry. One evening there came a terrible storm, with torrents of rain like Noah's flood. In the midst of it the crows noticed a monkey sliding along, drenched and draggle-tailed, looking like a drowned rat. The crows set up a chorus of caws, and called out, "'Oh, monkey, what a fool you must be! Look at us, dry and comfortable in our nests of rags and twigs. If we, with only our little beaks to help us, can make comfortable nests, why can't you, with two hands and two feet and a tail?' You might have thought the monkey would take this advice to heart, but not a bit of it. Monkeys are naturally a lazy tribe, and they are full of envy, hatred, and malice. What they like best is destroying whatever they can lay their hands on, and when I look upon some of the nations of this globe, I cannot help thinking that they really must be descended from monkeys. So this monkey snapped and snarled and said to the crows, 
just wait till morning and then we'll see what a monkey can do the simple birds were delighted to hear this and looked forward to seeing the monkey do something wonderfully clever with his tail and his two hands and two feet morning came and the rain was over the monkey climbed up into the tree and in his rage and envy he tore all the crows nests to pieces then the crows were sorry they spoke and determined for the future to mind their own business and let fools alone for as the wise man said to give good advice to a fool is like pouring oil upon the fire the swan and the paddy bird a wild swan was flying once to his home when he paused to rest on a tree this was a kind of tree you have most likely never seen it was very tall and had no branches upon it until you came to the top but at the top was a large clump of green leaves and bunches of coconuts hanging down it so happened that on this tree was the nest of a paddy bird a paddy bird is a bird something like a heron which feeds on fish and frogs at the moment when the swan perched upon the tree this paddy bird was sitting demurely on the edge of a pond that was now below the tree watching the water for a rise she had no fishing rod but when she saw a little fish or a frog swim past out went her beak like a flash and the fish was pierced then she ate the fish or carried it off to her little ones in the nest when the paddy bird chanced to look round she saw the swan sitting upon her tree she was frightened at this thinking that perhaps it was some bird of prey come to devour her chicks so she left her fishing and at once flew up to the top of the coconut tree the swan looked harmless enough when she came closer so plucking up courage the paddy bird thus addressed him good day sir may i ask who you are i am a swan said the other and i am on my way home but as it is a hot day i thought i would rest a while in your tree i hope you have no objections welcome my lord swan a welcome said the paddy bird i only wish i could offer you entertainment but i am ashamed to say that i have no food worth your taking i am a poor bird and you know we paddy birds eat only small fish and frogs which your highness would hardly touch oh never mind for that answered the swan thank you all the same but i can find my own food on this tree of yours this set our paddy bird's heart all a flutter for what could he mean but her brood however all was well in a minute when she saw the swan go to one of the green coconuts hanging to the tree you have seen i suppose three little soft places at the top of a coconut which are holes in the shell filled up with pulp the swan pierced his bill through one of these holes and drank the milk inside the coconut then he gave some of the milk to the paddy bird and flew away this milk tasted very nice and the paddy bird began to say to herself what a fool i have been all these years here i am watching and waiting all day long for a frog and nasty things they are too and all this while there was plenty of delicious milk within a yard of my nest well good-bye fish and good-bye frogs i have done with you now forever the next time the paddy bird felt hungry she flew to a coconut and began to peck at it but she did not know the secret of the three little holes at the top of the coconut so she pecked and pecked and got no further at last she gathered all her strength and gave a tremendous peck at the coconut snap her bill broke off and the blood ran out and very soon the poor paddy bird had bled to death next day the swan happened to fly by that way again and coming to the tree he found his friend the paddy bird lying dead on the ground with her bill snapped off clean he understood at once what had happened and said to himself this is what comes of trying to do what one is not fit for let the cobbler stick to his last or misfortune follows fast what is a man in a certain forest a lioness dwelt who had one cub this cub did not go to school as you one day will go but he learned his lessons at home and what do you think his lessons were not multiplication which is vexation not the rule of three which puzzles me not spelling and copy-books no the lioness had only one lesson to teach her cub and that was to avoid mankind as they were poison every day morning and evening she taught him for an hour telling him again and again that of all the beasts of the forest he need fear none for a lion is stronger than any but man he must fear and keep clear of 
Well, the little lion grew big, and as often happens to children as well as lion's cubs, he grew conceited too. Could not believe that his mother was old enough to know better than he. No, he would see for himself. So one fine day this lion set out on a voyage of discovery. The first thing he saw was an ox. This ox was a fine sturdy animal, and the lion felt rather nervous to see such hoofs and horns. You must remember he was young and ignorant, and had hardly seen any animal but his mother and father. So he went up to the ox and said timidly, "'Oh, good morning, sir. Will you be good enough to tell me if you are a man?' If an ox could laugh, that ox would have laughed in the face of the lion's cub. But an ox is always solemn, like a Turk, though he does not love bloodshed as a Turk does. This ox was chewing the cud, munching and mouthing with great calmness, so as to get the full flavor of the rich grass. He turned his meek eyes and stared at the lion. Then he said, A man? God forbid! A man is a terrible creature. He makes slaves of us oxen, and puts a yoke on our necks, and fastens us to a thing called a plow, and makes us pull the plow to and fro, up and down, till we are tired to death. If we don't go, he sticks a prod into us, which hurts us very much. I can't think what is the use of all this pother. We get no good of it, and when we are old and can work no more, he kills us and eats our flesh, and the skin he makes into shoes for his own feet. Keep clear of men if you value your life. Then the ox turned his head away and went on with his chewing. This gave our lion something to think about. He thought the ox a very fine animal indeed, and yet, said the ox, a man was stronger. The lion went his way, and by and by what should he see but a camel? If the ox was a fine creature, here was a finer, ever so tall, with a hump on his back and a long neck and great long legs. Surely this must be the terrible man he had heard so much of. But to make certain, he approached the camel with great respect and said, "'Good morning, sir. Pray, will you tell me if you are a man?' The camel turned his long neck and sniffed and sneered, as camels have a way of doing, and a most unpleasant way it is. Pooh said he, stuff, poof, you oaf, you think me a man? I wish I were a man, wouldn't I make short work of you? A man, quota, why, I am a slave to that same man. They catch us, these men, and make a hole in our noses and put a ring in it. Do you see my ring? How do you think I like a hole made in my nose, as if two holes were not enough? Then they tie a rope to the ring and lead us about all day long, just where they please, without a with your leave or by your leave. And they make us squat down in the mud, and put a great load on our backs, enough to crush a whippersnapper like you. Groan as we may, it's all of no use. They do what they choose. Man, the very name makes me shiver. Get out and leave me alone. This frightened our lion, because who knew whether the great animal might not kill him if it came into his head? So the lion went away as fast as he could. In a little while he espied an elephant. Here was a monster, to be sure. A great black mountain with a long nose curling about, and huge white teeth sticking out, and big ears flapping. The lion was quite terrified this time, and would not go near the elephant, until he suddenly saw that the elephant had a rope round his tusks, by which he was tied fast to a stake. Then he plucked up courage to approach, and said, "'Good morning, my lord. Please tell me, are you a man?' The elephant trumpeted loudly. That was his way of laughing at the idea that he could be mistaken for a man. "'Haroo! Haroo!' he shrieked. "'A man! Haroo! No, but a man is my master, and that's the truth. A man tied me to this post. Cruel and selfish brutes are men, and with all my strength I am no match for a man. They get on our backs a dozen of them at a time, and make us fetch and carry and drive us about by sticking a sharp spike into our skulls. Don't you go near a man if you love your life. Why, bless me, they will make mincemeat out of you, aroo! The elephant swished his trunk all around him in his excitement. Our lion had now seen three astonishing creatures, and they all said that a man was stronger than they were. What could this terrible creature be like? He must be a mountain indeed if he was to master such a beast as the black elephant. Yet the black creature said that men got on his back, a dozen of them at a time. 
The lion could not understand it at all. He shook his head and stalked away, thoughtful. As the lion was going along, he saw a puny and weak-looking thing walking upright on two legs. He seemed to be a kind of monkey, thought the lion. It never entered his head that this little thing could be a man, but he trotted up to him gaily and said, Good morning, my friend. Can you tell me where I can find a man? I have been hunting for one all the morning. I am a man, said the other. At this the lion laughed in his face. You, a man, said he. Come, come, I may be young, but I am no fool, my good fellow. Why, you are not so big as one leg of that mountain over there, who was tied to a stake, as he said, by a man. All the same, the man said, I am one of them. But look here, the lion went on, my mother and father both say that man is a terrible and cruel creature, and the only creature a lion need fear. Now either you are no man, or else my father and mother are quite wrong. Well, said the man, I am not nearly so strong as you are, or the elephant and camel, or even the ox. As you say, I am not much to look at, but I have one power which you all lack. Indeed, said the lion, and what may that be? The man answered, Reason. I never heard of reason, said the lion. Please explain it to me, will you? It is not easy to explain what reason is, replied the man, but if you like I will show you how it works. The lion was pleased. Oh, please do, he said. I must tell you that this man was a woodcutter, and he had an axe upon his shoulder. He now lifted this axe and drove a blow into a stout sapling which grew hard by. When he had split the sapling, he took a wedge of wood and hammered it in with the back of his axe, until there was a large cleft in the trunk of the sapling. Now then, said the man, just put your paw in that hole. The lion obediently put his paw into the cleft, and then the man pulled out the wedge from the cleft. The sapling closed tight on the paw of the lion and squeezed it. Now, said the man, you know what reason is. But the lion no longer cared to hear about reason. All he wanted was to get his paw out of the cleft. He pulled and he tugged and he roared and he struggled, but all of no use. He could not by any means get his paw free. The end of all was, in madness and fury, he dashed his head against the ground and died. This is how the lion learnt how terrible a being is man, but unluckily, you see, his knowledge was of no use to him, or anyone else, because it cost him his life. If he had listened to his mother's teaching, he might be living still, and you would not be reading this story. THE WOUND AND THE SCAR there was once a forest where a lion dwelt. Over all the beasts of the forest the lion lorded it, and of men not one durst come near the place for fear of King Lion. None, that is, except one only, a woodman who lived in a little hut just upon the border of the woodland. And between the forest and the hut a river flowed. This woodman came often into the forest to cut wood, and he had no fear to do so, because the lion and he were bosom friends. Such fast friends they were, that if ever the woodman failed to pay his daily visit, the lion was grieved and missed him sorely. It happened once that the woodman fell ill of a fever. In his woodland hut he lay all alone, for no wife was there or sister to care for him. So he tossed and moaned and waited for the hours to pass. Of course, during all this time the woodman could not visit the forest, and his friend the lion missed him. What can be the matter? thought King Lion. Has some enemy killed him, or has he fallen sick? At last he could no longer bear the suspense, and set out in search of the woodman. I do not think that the lion had ever yet been to his friend's house, and for all he knew he might be walking straight into a trap but he was so fond of the woodman that he never thought of danger. All he wanted was to see his friend. Accordingly he followed the path by which the woodman came into the woods, and in due time this path led him to the bank of a wide and swift river, and over on the opposite bank was a hut. In plunged the lion, not waiting to think, and though there were crocodiles in that river ready to eat him, and though the current bade fair to sweep him away, so strong was his love for his friend that he swam across. The woodman's house stood within an enclosure, and all the doors and gates were shut, 
but the lion jumped over the wall and searched about until he managed somehow to force his way into the house then he saw his friend lying upon a bed and very ill all alone with no one to tend him how grieved the lion was to see his friend you can imagine better than i can tell the lion knelt down by his friend's side and began to lick him all over this woke the man from his dazed condition and when he found the lion licking his body he did not like the smell of the lion so he turned his head away with a grunt of disgust now i think this was very unkind because the lion had no other way of showing how much he cared for his friend think what a long way he had come to see his friend and think what danger he had faced and now to be met with a grunt of disgust the lion stopped licking the woodman and got up slowly and went away back he swam over the deep and swift river but all the heart was taken out of him he cared not for the crocodiles indeed now he would not have been very sorry if a crocodile had devoured him one crocodile did actually get a nip at his leg and left a wound there back to his den he crept solitary and sad and when he got to his den he lay down sick of his friend's fever which he had taken by licking him in a week or so the woodman was well again and thinking nothing of what had passed he shouldered his axe and trudged away to cut wood when the time came for his midday meal he went as his custom was to the lion's den and there he found his friend the lion thin and sick why friend what is the matter the woodman asked i am ill said the lion what is it asked the woodman again but the lion would answer nothing and do what he would the man could not get him to say another word so he left him for that day and went home for several days after the man did the same thing and gradually the lion got better at last one day when the lion was quite well again the man said to him tell me good friend lion what is it that has made you so silent and gloomy of late then answered the lion o oh, woodman i will tell you when you were ill i swam a swift river and faced death all for your sake i came into your house when you lay deserted and licked your body and took the fever which you had into my veins and this wound which you see i received from a crocodile as i was swimming across on my way back but you received me with scorn and turned away your face in disgust the fever is gone and this wound as you see is healed but the wound in my heart can never heal you are no true friend and from henceforth our ways lie apart the man was ashamed of his unkindness but it was too late for as the poet says who snaps the thread of friendship never more can join it as it once was joined before the cat and the parrot once upon a time a cat and a parrot had joint lease of a certain piece of land which they tilled together one day the cat said to the parrot come friend let us go to the field said the parrot I can't come now because I am wetting my bill on the branch of a mango tree. So the cat went alone and plowed the field. When the field was plowed, the cat came to the parrot again and said, Come, friend, let us sow the corn. Said the parrot, I can't come now because I am wetting my beak on the branch of a mango tree. So the cat went alone and sowed the corn. The corn took root, the corn sprouted, it put forth the blade and the ear and the ripe corn in the ear then again the cat came to the parrot and said come friend let us go and gather the harvest said the parrot i can't come now because i am whetting my beak on the branch of a mango tree so the cat went alone and gathered the harvest she put it away in barns and made ready for threshing when all was ready for the threshing again the cat came to the parrot and said come friend let us thresh the corn said the parrot i can't come now because i am wetting my beak on the branch of a mango tree so the cat went and threshed all the corn alone then the cat came back to the parrot and said come friend let us go and winnow the grain from the chaff said the parrot i can't come now because i am wetting my beak on the branch of a mango tree so the cat winnowed the grain from the chaff alone then she came back once again to the parrot and said come friend the grain is all winnowed and sifted come and divide it between us certainly said the parrot and came at once you see the cat had done all the work but the parrot was quite ready to share the profit 
They divided the corn into two halves, and the Cat put her half away somewhere, and the Parrot carried his half to his nest. Then the Cat and the Parrot agreed to invite each other to dinner every day. That is to say, the Cat asked the Parrot today, and the Parrot asked the Cat tomorrow. The Cat's turn came first. Then the Cat went to market and bought a ha'porth of milk, a ha'porth of sugar, and a ha'porth of rice. When the Parrot came, there was nothing but this stingy fare. Moreover, the Cat was so inhospitable that she actually made the Parrot cook the food himself. Perhaps that was her way of rebuking her friend for his laziness. Next day the turn came to the Parrot. He procured about thirty pounds of flour and plenty of butter and everything else that was needed and cooked the food before his guest came. He made enough cakes to fill a washerwoman's basket, about five hundred. When the cat came, the parrot put before her four hundred and ninety-eight cakes in a heap and kept back for himself only two. The cat ate up the four hundred and ninety-eight cakes in about three minutes, and then he asked for more. The parrot set before her the two cakes he had kept for himself. The cat devoured them, and then asked for more. The parrot said, I have no more cakes, but if you are still hungry, you may eat me. The cat was still hungry, and ate the parrot, bones and beak and feathers. Thus the tables were turned, for if the parrot had the best of it before, the cat had the best of it now. An old woman happened to be near and saw this, so she picked up a stone and said, Shoo, shoo, go away, and I'll kill you with this stone. Now the cat thought to herself, I ate a basketful of cakes, I ate my friend the parrot, and shall I blush to eat this old hag? No, surely not. The cat devoured the old woman. The cat went along the road and perceived a washerman with a donkey. He said, O oh, cat, get away, or my donkey shall kick you to death. Thought the cat, I ate a basketful of cakes, I ate my friend the parrot, I ate the abusive old woman, and shall I blush to eat a washerman? No, surely not. The cat devoured the washerman. The cat next met the wedding procession of a king, a column of soldiers and a row of fine elephants, two and two. The king said, O oh, cat, get away, or my elephants will trample you to death. Thought the cat, I ate a basket full of cakes, I ate my friend the parrot, I ate the abusive old woman, I ate the washerman and his donkey, and shall I blush to eat a beggarly king? No, surely not. The cat devoured the king, and his procession, and his elephants too. Then the cat went on until he met a pair of land crabs. Run away, run away, pussy cat, said the land crabs, or we will nip you. Ha ha ha! laughed the cat, shaking her sides, fat enough they were by this time. I ate a basket full of cakes, I ate my friend the parrot, I ate an abusive old woman, I ate the washerman and his donkey, I ate the king and all his elephants, and shall I run away from a land crab? Not so, but I will eat the land crab too. So saying, she pounced upon the land crabs, gobble gobble slip slop, in two swallows the land crabs went down the cat's gullet. But although the land crabs slid down the cat's gullet easily enough, you must know that they are hard creatures, too hard for a cat to bite, so they took no harm at all. They found themselves amongst a crowd of creatures. There was the king, sitting with his head on his hands, very unhappy. There was the king's newly-wed bride in a dead faint. There was a company of soldiers trying to form fours, but rather muddled in mind. There was a herd of elephants trumpeting loudly. There was a donkey braying, and the washerman beating the donkey with a stick. There was the parrot whetting his beak on his own claws. Then there was the old woman abusing them all roundly, and last of all five hundred cakes neatly piled in a corner. The land crabs ran round to see what they could find, and they found that the inside of the cat was quite soft. They could not see anything at all except by flashes when the cat opened her mouth. But they could feel, so they opened their claws and nip, nip, nip. Meow! squealed the cat. Then came another nip and another great meow. The land crabs went on nipping until they had nipped a big round hole in the side of the cat. By this time the cat was lying down in great pain, and as the hole was very big, out walked the land crabs and scuttled away. Then out walked the king, carrying his bride, and out walked the elephants, two and two. 
Out walked the soldiers, who had succeeded in forming fours, right by your left, quick march. Out walked the donkey, with the watcherman driving him along. Out walked the old woman, giving the cat a piece of her mind. And last of all, out walked the parrot, with a cake in each claw. Then they all went about their business, as if nothing had happened, and the parrot flew back to whet his beak on the branch of the mango tree. End of Part 7 End of The Talking Thrush and Other Tales from India, collected by W. Crook and retold by W. H. D. Rouse.